science uh, communication is not about storytelling facts and ideas. Uh, it's about generating understanding. Research um, also uh, shows that scientists and professional communicators alike struggle uh, to convey complex information to uh, increasingly uh, skeptical audiences. This is why the School of Journalism and Communication launched the Media Center for Science and Technology last uh, fall. In keeping with the center's uh, mission uh, to build a bridge between science and communication fields, I would like to welcome Dennis uh, to the stage to lead us um, on a visual journey that um, I'm looking forward to see. Thank you so much for being here this week with us. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being out here on this rainy evening. And hello again to many of you who I've had the chance to uh, meet and talk with this week. So this is, after all of the other talks, this becomes kind of the capstone one in terms of some of the grand themes. And uh, what I want to talk with you this evening is about the human age, our Anthropocene conundrum. And I want to do it actually in three stories. First story is going to be one that places me in the world and in essentially in relation to you in the state of Oregon. So this is one of the early pictures that I took after I had taken up the camera as a college student. This is taken a couple of miles from our home, uh, Mount Hood overlooking the Willamette River. Uh, and this is, uh, when I was about a little over a year old, a photograph by my grandfather, uh, we grew up on a farm that was at one point up to 80 acres in size, just south of Lake Oswego. I went to the Westland School District. It was a great environment, to a laboratory to learn about the world. Um, and these recently discovered pictures reveal that I was, a, I was also a 4-H member. We raised purebred Suffolk sheep. I had a 4-H potato project that I exhibited at the Clackamas County Fair. I think these pictures actually were in support of that exhibit. And then later, so how the money got generated to go to college was to bake bale hay. And this is so I'm, I'm a good candidate for us. Uh, skin cancer, I guess. We'll find out. Right. This was just late south of Lake Oswego. And then uh, after my freshman year, I got, a, I got the camera and I started taking up photography in earnest and documenting everything around. Uh, we raised these sheep. I'd show them at the state and county fair. This was actually one of the earliest published pictures, a picture of my younger brother, uh, Rick. Uh, with a ewe and her newborn lamb. And then this is, um, this is as my photographic skills advanced, I had, had moved into my later Grant Wood American Gothic phase, right? And this was a portrait I did of our parents, uh, uh, Mary and John Dimmick, uh, real corn, a real barn. Uh, this was about 1986. And then from then on, then I became deeply involved in covering uh, important events of the world, like the Oregon-Oregon State dual track meet in 1973. And here is a, a famous former citizen of this city. And it was intriguing to watch Pre at that time in the 5,000. He was, here was Pre, and then here was everybody else, right? He was running in a world of his own. And then the work would move on. I worked at Papers in Corvallis and McMinnville, Pendleton and Walla Walla. Here, Oregon State and Stanford in 75. The Pendleton Roundup. Something's wrong with the picture. But, um, and then we, uh, then we, uh, uh, and then I did a big project on wheat in the Northwest economy when I was working at the Walla Walla Union Bulletin, doing things like traveling up and down the Columbia River to uh, spend time with the barge masters, moving wheat through the locks, trying to get a sense of how significant this crop really is to the Northwest. And then from there, it was two years in Louisville at the Courier Journal. and. Uh, 
it was my job to design the 16-page section that wrapped the paper on the Sunday morning after the race. We'd start about one in the afternoon and get done about two in the morning. But to lead towards why I'm here with you tonight, I'm going to then now begin to point towards some of the work at National Geographic, which uh, was, I think, inspired by my beginnings on the landscape and also my education in agriculture at that other university just up the road. Uh, big global issues, uh, global warning bulletins from a warming world. Uh, we devoted two thirds of the, uh, of the magazine to it in one issue. Uh-oh, excuse me, we have a technology problem here. And what we were trying to do was to begin to have a discussion with our primarily American readership about what this was, looking at physical change, ecological change, and the history of change. And the basic idea, we were looking for signs, we were showing signs, we were using photographs to show how the climate was changing and the whole project was underpinned by scientific studies. Every picture in the project was tied to some scientific study that had been published. And the basic equation, as we know, is that we're, as we burn these fuels that allow us to do things, most of us, to, to travel the world and turn the lights on, but there's also a cost to this. The planet's heating up, the ice is melting, and the seas are beginning to rise. That's one of the prim primary impacts we're seeing. Uh, more are becoming apparent over time. And then there were project, a project with James Baylog of Colorado, which was a story on the Big Thaw. Uh, he had come to us proposing to do an article on the melting glaciers of Iceland, and we said, no, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to do it all. So we sent him around the world to do a baseline coverage of, of, of melting glaciers that would eventually then become um, Extreme Ice Survey, which was a project that was funded in part by the National Geographic. Imagine placing 28 solar-powered time-lapse cameras at glaciers around the Northern Hemisphere, cameras that would take one picture an hour for every hour of daylight for a year, and then go get the cards from the cameras and start building movies, revealing the behavior of, of glaciers that's never been seen before. Here, spring to fall in the same year in Iceland. And then a cover story on soil conservation. Uh, that one took nine years to get into publication. I wrote the proposal, I think, in, in, in 2000. In late 2008, we published the article, Our Good Earth. And, the, one, and, and uh, we were trying to show what happens when we don't take care of the soil that we inherit. So if you look in this picture, this is in the Los Plains of China. And if you look up there on the plateau on the left, there are two men there and photographer Jim Richardson after completing his, getting his picture. I'm not sure how he got over there, but he did and he asked these two gentlemen, say, do you know if there's any soil erosion problem around here? And they looked around and said, not that we know of. <laughs> but I think the essence of this whole idea really is that soil is destiny. And in a place like the Willamette Valley, you are incredibly fortunate to have the soils that you have that, uh, washed down onto this land during the end of the last ice age. It's the history and the story of, of this region is a fascinating one. One can only, uh, it's not hard to guess who has the better life here, the woman and her children in Niger or the woman in the rice field in China. A special issue on water in, where we went to the Tibetan plateau, where the ice, the third pole, the ice is melting, or women who must walk a minimum of five miles a day carrying heavy cans to bring water back to their homes because they have no plumbing, or scientists who are trying to study endangered uh, um, shelled organisms in rivers of the southeast or the hydraulic society, the Western United States, that, that lives and dies on imported water. This is uh, Lake Shasta during the middle of uh, one of their frequent droughts. Uh, 
Then there was a year-long series on world population. Uh, population seven billion, and the idea really was to try to understand, understand uh, what that means, what are the implications for humanity, and also for the planet. And so this was a year-long series, and I think one of the key insights that we got out of this is one of the most uh, powerful things is to try to educate young girls, because if you can do that, they, will, they, will, they, can, they can have control, more control over their destiny. They can have the choice of career. They can make their own reproductive choice, and that has a big impact on the size of future population. So when you do a series on population all year long, one of the logical sequel questions becomes, what will be for lunch? In 2011, the world population was at 7 billion. We're now at 7.5. And so that became the impetus for another series, two years long, uh, a five-step plan to feed the world. It was inspired by a scientific study by, uh, written by John Foley from the University of Minnesota and his collaborators that was published in the journal Nature. It was called Solutions for a Cultivated Planet. And we were trying to help people understand that there are ways to feed the planet without just necessarily always having to grow more food. And photographically, what we did is we tried to portray the epic scale of agriculture. It is, uh, it, its scale is profound from the plains of Kansas to these chicken uh, facilities in Brazil. And from there also, what we wanted to do was to help people meet the farmers who grow their food. And so what you see here is this woman in Peru with her potatoes. Photographer Jim Richardson went around the world to, to come to meet and to photograph and show us all the people around the world, the faces of the many people who are the ones that keep us all from starvation. So what we are really dealing here in cumulative are uh, climate, energy, water, population, and food. And they are all issues that are interconnected. Food is dependent upon water. Food is dependent on energy. Energy is dependent on, on um, uh, water. Uh, population, we're all connected, and, and as the climate is changing, that's affecting everything that we, we do. And which brings me to the central part of this talk is about now this human story. And there is an emergent scientific movement to declare what is called, we are now entering what is called a, the human age. And scientists, a group of scientists, have, have been petitioning the geologic bodies to call the, to call, uh, to establish a new geologic epoch called the Anthropocene, or the Human Age. And what it is is a proposed geologic epoch defined by our massive impact on the planet, where the mark of our presence will endure in the geologic record long after we are gone. And that was one of the stories that we did in that population series. It was called Enter the Anthropocene, Age of Man. It was written by Elizabeth Colbert of The New Yorker. And what it was was really trying to help paint a picture of what the world looks like that we, are, we have a hand in creating, whether it's from this mountaintop mine in Kentucky to Hoover Dam on the Colorado. But it wasn't just us. The Economist was writing about this. And, and, and then since, there has been a whole growing body of, of literature about this idea, uh, the emerging Anthropocene, what it is, what it means. And I hope to try to help illuminate for you uh, some of these dimensions. So the questions are, well, when did it begin? Did it begin when humans started farming the planet, when agriculture began? Did it begin in, during this, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, when we started burning coal uh, to um, start manufacturing things? Or did it start at, 
uh, during the nuclear age in the 1950s when we were uh, when we were blowing up bombs and all of these activities in one way or another are leaving a record in the rocks of the world scientists can find them you can find the carbon dioxide um, in ice cores, you can find the residues of nuclear explosions in, in rocks and in trees around the world. Uh, you can find the, the, the residues of agri ancient agricultural processes in changes in, in uh, river sedimentation around the world. So each one of those is an activity. But Ultimately, what it is, whether or not it's a geologic epic, it is also a novel way for us to also contemplate our relationship with the Earth at this point in history. And to understand how we get here, what we need to do is to think about how human civilization has, has um, survived for most of its history. And it starts with current sunshine, the sunshine falling on this blue and green planet. And it was photosynthesis that allowed life to, to uh, expand across the planet. And it is that photosynthesis is what is the basis of all of the, say, the crops that we grow, the plants that are the trees that we harvest for wood, for heating, it, this basic equation capturing the energy from current sunshine, from the current sunshine that falls on the planet. It feeds, it allows things like algae to grow and all of the plants that then we grow and harvest, or the forests that grow and soak up carbon dioxide, but also provide us fuel if we want to stay warm here in a place that has ample trees, many burn wood for their heat. Well, that's the wood is really an example of current sunshine because it's, it's not fossilized, it's reasonably current. But what happened about 300 years ago is that we discovered uh, a genie. We opened a box, we dug holes in the ground, and we realized that we had found a black rock that burns, coal. And that has actually transformed human history. Uh, just like that sun, shine that I showed you earlier. This is essentially ancient sunshine that we, that we light. We're lighting the ancient, the fossilized remains of, of 400 million year old plants and animals on. Uh, we're lighting them on fire. Uh, we're digging them up and we're lighting them on fire. And that's how we're powder, pow, powering the modern world as we extract coal from mines like this in Wyoming, put, put it on trains, and then use it to generate electricity in the eastern United States. Or in China, we, we benefit by the coal that has been dug and burned to manufacture perhaps all those phones that are sitting in our pockets. And it's not just there, it's also India. Coal remains one of the primary energy sources across the world that keeps the lights on. And then there's oil. And if you look north into the um, boreal forest of Alberta, what you will find are landscapes like this that we have been transforming into energy production landscapes. This is where um, oil sands or tar sands come from. And at this point, um, the oil that's generated from Canadian oil sands is the dominant import of foreign oil into the United States. And then in the last decade or so, there's been a revolution in technology that's allowed what's called hydraulic fracturing or fracking to uh, unlock oil from wells that might have been seen as played out or it's revolutionized the natural gas industry in this country and has actually allowed us to dramatically in reduce our reliance on coal for electricity generation. So as Dan Nocera from Harvard University has said, every year by burning fossil fuels, we release a million years of photosynthesis. What that means is that you, know, you dig up the coal that we dig up, the oil that we burn, it took a million years to store that energy in the ground. And so there's a, a ratio of a million to one 
that, that we're then releasing back into the atmosphere. In other words, every year by burning fossil fuels, we release a million years of storage sunshine. It's concentrated energy. That's why it's so valuable to us. Oil is an incredible resource in terms of its BTUs. Uh, there really is no other replacement for it. And so what have we done? Well, look at this. This is the electric world, right? Um, this, this is the product of all of that energy that we have been able to figure out how to use, lighting up the night, and if it's not the electricity that is generated by coal or natural gas, then it's the oil that has given us mobility, that gave me the opportunity to come out here and visit with you, that, that gave uh, all of you who drove here tonight the chance to be here. But beyond that, what's also happened is because of the presence of these, these uh, economic and easily available fuels, we've also transformed world food production. What we see here is a uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer plant in Africa. What is little known is, for those who are in the food production business, they know this, but in the early 1900s, two German scientists, Haber and Bosch, invented a process to uh, synthesize nitrogen from the atmosphere by using natural gas. So the presence of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer reduced nutrient limitations and, and with the use of oil, we have been able to rapidly and dramatically mechanize agriculture and through the use of the nutrients from nitrogen fertilizer has given us an incredible volumes of food that we've been able to also harvest and do things like feed to not only um, feed to ourselves, but to livestock. And also now we're feeding cars with these crops. And we put these crops on ships and we send them all over the world and we've created a global food economy. And it's all as a result of, of the availability of these these very powerful, uh, easily available fuels. And so what we have is we have created an industrial food economy and people are eating better, right? That's, we have, we're not wanting most of us for, for food, but there still remains almost a billion people in the world who are still short of food. And in light of that, it's also interesting to know that if you have more energy and more food, it's quite possible also to contemplate that we have more people. And what's intriguing is that in 1900, there were 1.6 billion people on the planet. And in just 100 years later, exactly 100 years later, that flipped. That was one of the most rapid increases in population in history in just 100 years. But since then, in 2018, we're now at 7.5. World population has tripled in the last 75 years. It will likely never triple again. It's hard to imagine a world with 22 uh, million people on it. So by mid-century, we're looking at this and maybe 11. So what we have, though, through the availability of energy, food, and now people, we are living on a planet transformed. And as you look around, for example, here, the Yangtze River Delta near Shanghai, in 30 years, watch how it changes. See, uh, cities growing, many, the growth of many big cities around the world to, to uh, house uh, people, uh, we're building highways, we're transforming rural landscapes, uh, going to the far horizon, and we're able to. It's like because we can drive. And so we put up our instant lawns. And if you look here, what you can see is you look in the Amazon. So this is in 1984. This is in Rondoni, Brazil. And you fo go forward to 2011. So that's, we're deforesting, we're building dams, building reservoirs, but this is also one of the primary ways that we're expanding food production, is by expanding our footprint. So the free-flowing rivers around the world, what we've done also is that we've dammed 
many of them here. Shasta Dam, just south of uh, just south of the state line in California, the largest dam in the state of California, provides irrigation, water, and energy for uh, the state. The hydropower uh, is the dominant form of electricity here. It's also uh, dams are what are so important for irrigation. Without the dam systems in California, the Central Valley would be a desert. And in some cases already, the Colorado never makes it to the sea anymore, nor does the Yellow Sea, because we've subscribed all the resources. We've taken it all up. Here, the Aral Sea in Southwest um, Asia uh, used to be the, what the world's fourth largest freshwater lake. It's almost gone because of upstream freshwater diversions for agriculture. And in the Punjab of India, for example, you look at this scene and you go, "Wow, that's that's pretty ample looking." But what you uh, don't, what we, uh, what's happening here is that the water to irrigate this crop is coming from depleting fossil aquifers that are being drawn down here and in other locations, like here, for example, in Saudi Arabia. So after the Arab oil embargo in the early 1970s, the Saudis decided that they needed to become self-sufficient in food. So, and they were sitting on top of fossil aquifers, so they transformed their deserts into green agricultural landscapes. But now they're running out of water and they're going back to the world grain market. And so there are downstream impacts from this. Many of the agricultural processes, growing of crops, the use of nitrogen fertilizer, we're also seeing that there's nutrient runoff that's happening in polluting coastal estuaries. This is, for example, on the Klamath River. So we're living in a world of more, really, more food, more people, and more growth. And underlying all of that is more energy. That's what keeps the wheels turning. That's what keeps the lights on as population expands, as more of us want to eat higher on the food chain. So we keep digging more coal, like here. This is uh, in Appalachia, drilling for more gas. This is in the Texas Panhandle near Allison. Or and this is for oil uh, in Southern California near Bakersfield. But you see, it's not just for keeping lights on and transportation, for example, that we're so reliant on, on fossil energy. For example, here, this image, everything in this picture that you see that came out of this house uh, was manufactured with the use of oil. So besides transportation, uh, we are deeply embedded in our, in our need. We're deeply wedded to these fuels to keep uh, modern, the modern economy going. So in the early 1970s, actually, there, were, uh, there was a, a, a formula that came about, and, and it was proposed by Paul Ehrlich, John Holdren, and Barry Commoner. Uh, Paul Ehrlich uh, you know, wrote the population bomb. He's at Stanford. John Holdren was Obama's science advisor. Impact. IPAT, population times affluence times technology. And we used this in that Anthropocene story some years ago. The goal was to try to help people visualize our impact. How do you help people imagine what does this all look like in its cumulative? And so what you see there in the smaller rectangle there, the, the smallest one is 1900. Uh, the bigger one is... Uh, 1950. Fast forward 61 years, that's 2011. So there's been a radical uptick in sort of economic activity, you know, the tripling of population. And this is sort of a, a trying to visualize our cumulative impact on the planet. So what does this look like, really? Well, we continue to burn forests to convert to farmland. This is in the Amazon. This is in Borneo. This is for what was uh, rainforest has been cut down so that it can be replaced by palm oil plantations. 
Uh, this is 40,000 acres of irrigated cropland in Texas where the water's coming from depleting aquifers. This is uh, urban development east of Los Angeles. And I think uh, this is fracking. This is uh, salt pans in, on the Nevada-Utah border. And so through history, we have, we, have, we have been involved in environmental exploitation, and it's, we, we shouldn't forget that back, for example, 2,000 years ago in Syria, this land at Palmyra used to be covered in trees that captured fog to water themselves. And the trees got cut down, the trees were gone, the soil blew away, and so did the civilization. So we, the, it's important for us to not forget the lessons of the past. So some of our crises we don't see because they're out of sight. So our, our nutrient runoffs from coastal environments are decimating some of our coral reefs. And we've already caught more than 90% of the large fish from the sea. So it's not just a land issue that we're facing. We're also facing a species issue. Um, my, colleague Joel Sartori has started a project to document the species around the world that are, one could say, on their last legs. But what is so fascinating, though, is to understand when we talk about pre um, preserving wild species and wild places. Uh, this chart, actually, from Randall M Monroe, this is all about Earth's land mammals by weight. And if you look way down at the bottom, there is one square there for elephants, right? And then you look around and what each one of those squares is is a million tons. And so on the left, though, there's all the cattle, top rights, the pigs, the goats, the sheep. You can see that the wild animals have been kind of shoved to the edge. So we've already domesticated the planet and there we are in the middle. So when we, when we talk about preservation of wild, there's not that much wild left to preserve. And so what we've done, for example, is here wild free roaming buffalo on the Great Plains, we have, we have shifted those landscapes from this, from this kind of scene more to these kinds of scenes. This is a cattle feedlot in Kansas that then provides the meat that those of us who eat it will eat. So when you then contemplate some of the impacts, one of those things has been that with all the use of this fuel, that we've begun to change some of the chemistry of the planet, and one of those things has been the atmosphere. We're adding what's called CO2 to, to, the, to the atmosphere. We're now at levels higher than we've seen in millions of years as, as we've been able to determine from ice cores. Uh, the zigzag there, for those of you who wonder, in the northern hemisphere spring, when deciduous trees come out, start leafing out, they start soaking up carbon. That's why you see this interannular zigzag. As it goes, down, it goes down in the spring, but in the summer and fall, as the leaves get tired and fall off the trees, that's why you see it go up within each year. But atmospheric CO2 is a fascinating uh, element. It's radiative, it traps heat. And if we didn't have CO2 in the atmosphere, Earth would be an ice ball. And so we live in this kind of Goldilocks world uh, since the end of the last ice age, where it's been not too hot, not too cold, and it's been just right for the, for the, the flourishing of human civilization. But what we're doing is we're adding more and we add more, it's like adding blankets to your bed. And uh, CO2 has this interesting uh, property. So imagine if you put your hand in front of a hot iron or an, a fire, you feel the heat. That's the radiant energy. And, that, and that's, that's the reflected energy that comes off the earth after the sunlight hits the earth. And it bounces back into the sky. And as there's more CO2 in the sky, it actually traps that heat near the earth. 
And we've, we've been studying this for some time, for decades. This is Lonnie Thompson at Ohio State University who, uh, pull, who drills ice cores in glaciers and has been able to paint a picture of past climate. People who do, who do tree ring studies, or in the case here on the right, that's a cave stalagmite from Missouri that, that shows us the climate of the last 130,000 years in the state of Missouri. And these, these are all records that we can tie together and begin to paint a picture of what the past climate was. We can even use corals from the bottom of the sea and help start painting a picture of how temperatures have risen and fallen as CO2 has changed over history. And in one article a few years ago, we painted that picture of what it looked like over 4,000 years and how CO2 temperature and sea level were tied together so what we see here really is that the climate of the Earth has shifted through things because of the shifting orbit of the Earth around the sun. It's not always, it's not always been circular. It varies on 100,000 ci year cycles between circular and elliptical. The wobble of the Earth, the tilt of the Earth, it's all changed and through history that has actually been what has caused the onset and end of ice ages. But what we see here is that um, sea level is the, is the green, temperature is the yellow or the orange, and CO2 levels are the blue. And as you can see through history, they have essentially traveled hand in hand in, on long time scales. And at the start of the Industrial Revolution, we were at 280 parts per million. We're now uh, uh, more than a third higher. So if you look at history and you see what's happening today, it's it's not hard to conclude that then inevitably things like temperature and sea level are going to come into line with, with the, the CO2 levels that we have on the planet. So one thing that we do know is that recent years have been, as we have been keeping weather records, they have been warming up. And I built this slide uh, last fall and it's already out of date because uh, last year was the second warmest. And so it was it instead of 16 out of 17, it's now 17 out of 18. This is since weather records have been kept. So what does this look like? So if you come to the Arctic and you look at the ice cap, which is uh, an area of intense study, uh, in 1979, the very first pictures were taken of it by satellites, and this is what it looked like at the end of the summer. Uh, go forward to 2012, and half of it had vanished because of rising temperatures. So we're seeing changes in the ice of the planet. Here, this pair of pictures that were taken over six years in Alaska by James Baylog from that project I mentioned earlier. This is the Columbia Glacier in 2006, fast forward six years. 2012. So what's happening is that the ice on, on continental glaciers like Greenland is starting to thaw. Water is running off. We're beginning to see changes in sea level. In the eastern coast of the United States, it's already risen about a foot in the last year, in the last 100 years. We're already seeing islands in the Chesapeake Bay vanish. And this is a situation that I saw myself during, a, it was just a, 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 a modest storm on the coast of Virginia three years ago. So increasingly we read reports about storms that uh, drop 50 inches of rain, like here in Houston. And we read the reports about our attempts to rescue people. All of these kinds of things are the kinds of events that we can expect to see more of. One thing that's fascinating is another independent sort of confirmation of shift is maps of growing seasons. And so this is a map that was uh, done in 1990 and I will put a, there's a dot, I put it on the map near where we are and so what has happened though, as we shift forward, watch how these are growing zones. These are, this is the time of year after last freeze date 
in the spring and before first freeze date in the fall, growing seasons are getting longer. We're losing the cold. We're losing the cold in the, in the north. The, the warm is moving up. So growing seasons are getting longer. We're seeing plants migrate. We're also seeing things like in the west, we're seeing uh, more fires, longer fire seasons. And this study that w has an ongoing study by uh, Philip Moat at Oregon State has been going on now for more than five decades. And what this is showing is trends in snowpack in the western United States. Uh, the database was updated just this year, so it, it's being kept updated. The red circles are showing where we're losing snowpack in the west. The blue circles are where we're growing. The snowpack is what recharges our reservoirs and provides water for us late in the summer and into the fall. So here, for example, Mount, Mount Lassen, this was what it looked like at the end of the snow season in 2014. I flew by it a Sunday coming up here and there is much more snow in this picture than I saw there. And so it's always increasingly this, this quest. We need, to, we, we need the water, but slowly but surely we're losing it and it's the water that we need to grow the crops in the arid Southwest or to provide water for human society and as uh, I had pointed out earlier, I mean, these kinds of uh, situations have happened before and, uh, and that when people have lost the water that they need to survive, then abandonment occurs. So the question really is, where are we going? And that's, where are we going and what might we do? That's what I would like to take you towards at the end here. So this is a study that was done in 2009, published in the journal Science. Um, Roz Naylor of Stanford and David Battisti of the University of Washington were trying to determine what summer temperatures would look like across the planet if we kept emitting carbon into the atmosphere under what is called a business as usual scenario. And going forward, remember this is 2018, so 22 years from now, this map is showing what percentage of the, of the continents are going to have summers that are hotter than we've ever witnessed. They used the summer of 2003 in Europe, which was severe as a baseline, as an example. And what you see is in, large, in some areas of the West, the Southwest, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, uh, central California, that's at mid-century, but when you go forward, what you see is a radical uptick in summer, summer temperatures, and one of the big issues that you're facing is agricultural production, because much of the farm production um, occurs, that's occurring between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south is rain-fed agriculture for subsistence farming, and when you lose that rain, you're gonna lose your crops. And this is a, a study that we published as part of our food series that came from the International Food Policy Research Institute, the question about change in potential average yields for corn, potatoes, rice, and wheat at mid-century. And what you can see here is that as temperatures go up, one, cor one uh, crop that's particularly vulnerable will be corn. So part of this is what we need to do is confront the reality of the tra trajectory we are on. I love this picture by Jim Richardson. It, it sort of like shows they're up there, they realize the storm is coming, so we're gonna face up to it. And so the question comes down, are we going to continue on the energy trajectory that we have been on, or are we going to find a way perhaps to decarbonize the global economy, uh, come back more to current solar energy, abandon our heavy reliance on fossil sunshine. It, uh, one of the issues with fossil sunshine, coal, oil, and gas, is it's been, it's been great, it's created the modern world that we live in, but it also now is in a position to threaten the very society that it helped create. So if we can find ways to get back to a 
more energy efficient and low carbon economy that can perhaps help us uh, reduce the future impact of climate. And that would be things like energy and conservation, low carbon fuel, renewables, renewed forests, and capturing and storing carbon. And what does that look like, right? Better fuel economy, more mass transit, energy efficient buildings. They all add up, little things add up. So this picture was actually taken when compact fluorescent bulbs were the thing. And uh, they have since been replaced by LEDs that are an order of magnitude more efficient. Uh, this CFL, it's called, if it were put in somebody's house for one year, would have saved a quarter ton of, of coal. So think about if you had an LED. It means wind, it means more solar, it may mean nuclear. I think what you need to understand is once you realize the, the, the impact of using the atmosphere as a sewer for CO2 and the impact that it's having on the global climate, you, can't, you have to be willing to have an all hands on deck scenario. Maybe it's biodiesel from algae or geothermal. And one of the things that, we, that scientists keep saying we have to do is to learn how to store CO2 pollution or even learn to take, find ways to take it out of the atmosphere. But above, above all, one of the most important things is we need to preserve forests because either preserve forests, save forests, or even grow forests because they are perhaps the, the most significant near-term way that we can actually start soaking uh, uh, soaking carbon up from the atmosphere. So the last thing really at the end is this question of well, so what are the best things to do? And I will, as some of you have already seen, I will recommend to you this project that was published last year. It's called Drawdown. It's 100 Ways to Cut Climate Change, drawdown.org. Uh, it's all online, the whole thing. And the top 10 solutions to climate change uh, are intriguing. And I'll walk through those quickly with you, and then I'll be done, and you can, we can ask a few questions. Refrigerant management, number one. So the idea really is that what we're trying to do is to try to s save the greatest amount of carbon from getting into the atmosphere uh, for the least cost and the greatest benefit. And the reason, the reason for refrigerant management is because uh, as the world gets warmer, more people want air conditioners. And we, as for example, uh, when I grew up uh, around Portland, air conditioning was hardly a thing we even thought of. Now, I think the installed base of new air conditioners in Portland is about 63%. It would be intriguing to map the growth of, uh, sort of like watch the, the northward movement of air conditioners to get a sense of what this really looks like. But the thing is, remember, in a warmer world, so people are gonna wanna stay cooler and then they're gonna buy air conditioners. And then where's the power gonna come from? And if it doesn't come from carbon-free energy, if it comes from coal, for example, that means then we're gonna trap more heat near the earth. It will get warmer. We'll need even more air conditioners. We'll need even more power plants. It becomes this cycle. And the thing about managing refrigerants is, is the coolants in air conditioners, if they leak out, they're actually a much more powerful heat trapping gas than even CO2 or methane. So if we can keep them from leaking out as more people get uh, air conditioning, that is one of the most effective ways we can keep from getting warm. Generating energy from onshore wind, reducing food waste, third most important, more plant diets, eating lower on the food chain. A pound of bread gives you a loaf of, a, a pound of wheat gives you a loaf of bread. A pound of wheat gives you one eighth of a pound of steak. So it's gonna take eight pounds of grain to give you a pound of steak. It's gonna give you a whole loaf of bread, uh, one pound. Save tropical forests, as I said earlier, because it soaks up carbon. Educating girls. As I mentioned earlier, that that's one way that you can you can flatten the, the population growth curve in combination with family planning, giving girls choices over their reproductive future. Those are two very important ways to help uh, manage climate change. Solar farms, silvopasture—that means combining pastures with forests. 
and number 10 is rooftop solar. So that, those at least are some of the choices that we can make and perhaps, and some are better than others. And it's a way also to think about what we can do to improve the situation at hand in the future. So all of this really has been part of a discussion that I've begun with my friend Jim Richardson, who I've worked with for 20 years. And we go to universities and talk about these issues. Uh, and we have put up a website that uh, we've written about many of these issues. We've linked to many of the resources that, that, that are useful for those of you who are interested in, in inspiring a new generation of environmental storytellers, environmental photographers. And it's called Eyes on Earth, eyesonearth And just last week, we put a blog post up that gives resources on telling these kinds of environmental stories. And you can find that at Eyes on eyesonearth slash blog. Yeah, sure I am because you people are here. Seri no, seriously, because I think that, that where we are, and I did mention this to one of the classes today, when I can give you the list of refrigerant management and all the top 10, but actually the most important thing is going to be um, a new generation of citizens, storytellers, people who are making decisions about what they're going to do in the world. And you can make choices about how you're going to, say, consume natural resources and be better green citizens, but also you can make choices about what you're going to do or be in the world when you go out in the world. Maybe you'll become, maybe you'll invent some, something that will allow us to soak up carbon. Maybe you'll become a policymaker that will, that will help help the Congress of the U.S. realize it's important for us to transition to renewable energy in the same way we started building tanks in World War II to, to win that war. It's a similar kind of thing. Yeah, it's a great question. So how fast can we transition? Well, we're not transitioning fast enough, okay? Uh, Ken Caldera of Stanford Carnegie, the Carnegie Institution of Science has actually been studying that. And at the rate we're transitioning to renewables off of fossil energy, it'll take us 400 years. We actually need to speed up the transition in order of magnitude, okay? We're 10% of the way there. I mean, it, it becomes less a question about uh, the tools and the technology we're already at a place where solar and wind, generating a kilowatt hour of electricity from solar wind is cheaper than gas or, or coal. See, so then the, so the economics are begin, becoming in our favor. The question is, how do, you, how do you help the leaders of society realize this is something that's important for us to do? And if it's economic, if it's cheaper to do, uh, last week, I was at a conference, the Planet Forward conference at George Washington University, and the president of American Electric Power, which is one of the biggest power utilities in the East, was asked that question, uh, are you, because of the encouragement of the current administration, are you going to be building any more coal plants in the abs? And the answer was never. See, so there's a realization that it's, it's a fuel that's time, its time has passed, but then the question is how fast can we decarbonize the economy and come up with, come up with uh, carbon-free energy? So it's a challenge for all of us to, you know, not only is it a challenge for us to change technologies, it's also a challenge for us to change mindsets of people. So uh, when we did the series on population, we did have, uh, we did have a story on how uh, countries were going through uh, what's called a demographic transition, where you're getting from moving from one generation to the next or two generations later, you were, you were uh, moving from, say, an average fertility rate of six to less than replacement of two. Right. Brazil was doing a really good job. And they were actually using social media messaging and television as a way to transform people's views. It's an interesting thing, though, as, as 
uh, girls and women become part of the workforce and are able to control their own economic destiny, that serves also as a driver down of fertility. Yeah, storytelling is a great thing, and, and you're absolutely right. We know, we actually, the climate science and what we understand about how the physics of carbon works in the atmosphere, it's like we get that part. The issue now is the policy part. How do you get people to change their, their approach to doing business? It's really hard because we are all living in, in a culture where the systems that we rely on are deeply embedded. And if somebody builds a coal-fired power plant, I mean, just in terms of investment, you're into that for 75 years. And so really the questions, some of the questions that we're all trying to confront is, you know, follow the money. How can you help? That's really what somebody like Bill McKibben has been trying to do, has been trying to interrupt interrupt the, the financial incentives for per perpetuating the status quo. So if, if you have money available and you want to generate power, then you're at a critical point when you decide, I'm going to invest this in a coal plant or in solar and wind, because these are such long-term investments. So in trying to get the financial community and maybe it's going to happen more because actually the, 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 the renewables are now becoming so economic. It doesn't make financial sense to invest in the old line technologies. That's actually, an, that's, a, that's, one of, that's a really important question. The issue at hand though is it is the system that we're that we're currently living in the middle of. And so the, the current levers of incentives and rewards have been to perpetuate the status quo. And how do you get, how do you get the incentives to change? How do you make it possible to accelerate the, renew, the acceptance or the growth of, of renewables? And you're absolutely right. The question of growth, I mean, also, population is growing. You see, it's a moving target. It's like we can't, we can transition, we can transition to renewables, but we're also trying to tran go through an energy transition for a world that's demanding more and more energy as we go. Address I'm not change. actually, Right, that's a good question. How do you talk to somebody who's not entirely convinced? Well, I think when you look at across the, the population there, you know, there's, um, um, there are groups of people who are saying that we're not doing anywhere near enough, right? And there are others who are saying all of this is bunk, right? But there's also a vast middle in there who are thirsting for at least some knowledge and for fact-based information that can help them make decisions, right? That's about all I can do is I can hope that I can begin to try to reach people who are st still have their minds open and they're trying to gather more information. That's, a, I think, for those of you, so we're here at the journalism school, I think that that becomes one of the most imp important places where journalists can also play because if you can, you can produce uh, knowledgeable, fact-based, accurate information. That's what citizens need going forward to make good decisions. They're not going to get good information from social media platforms, from unsourced, you know, uh, uh, sources that that may well that that may well accelerate our emotional responses, but doesn't help us make better societal decisions. Well, that's a, that's a good question. But nobody ever said telling these kinds of stories was the only kind of thing you were going to do, right? And I think that that's one thing that, one thing that 
all I'm really trying to do is to try to get people to think about things in ways that they might not have. And if you, as a journalist, you can, when you're, you can write your stories that actually provide context when you're writing about some of these issues, if, we're, if we can help people understand the why, then maybe we can help change minds. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a tough question. I'm not asking you to be impoverished. <laughs>